Okay, so we are looking at um, okay. Thanks, Daniel, for reminding uh, spiritual dimensions of the church, and so we are saying okay, uh, in the natural, this is what you know a church looks like: people gathering, people worshiping, people, you know. So in the spirit realm, you know, how does God look at it? You know, what is the what are the you know dimensions meaning? What are the possibilities? What are the you know, ways in which we actually, you know, in the spirit realm, uh, how do how does the church look like? What does the Lord see it as? Okay, um, so so let's look at that. Okay, the first thing that we see is that what we see in Colossians one eighteen. Okay, let's read through some of the scriptures. So this gives us a blueprint. Okay, this gives us an idea. Okay, it says Colossians one eighteen and we're and verse 24 it says he is the head of the body the church who the lord jesus he is the head of the body so you know paul is using the analogy of a body he is he is the head and he is the head of the body and what is the body or who is the body the church right um and he's saying you know about jesus who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead that in all things he may have preeminence Okay, verse 18, right? 24, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Okay, another uh, verse, Ephesians 1, 22, 23. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body okay and um, also we see that as believers 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how each one of us when we believe in Jesus when we are born again excuse me we are baptized into the body of Christ okay so spiritually speaking this is what we are we are actually part of the body of Christ now that gives rise to endless possibilities now, who placed us, who placed us, or who joined us to Christ? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit baptized us. Now, that is another baptism that we see, apart from water baptism and Holy Spirit baptism, that we are actually baptized, immersed, placed in the body of Christ, a okay, spiritual body of Christ that we see, that we are actually part of it. We are connected. We are part of it. You know, we are united with Him. And so also with other believers. Okay, now... They might be believing different things, but as long as the core, as long as the center, uh, the foundation is Jesus, right? And we believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life. That He is the Savior. We are, you know, we are, and you know, and also about salvation. That salvation is um, by grace through faith. When we, when a person believes that, we are actually part of the body. We are all. One in Christ, right? So, so that's something that we 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 see that um, that we are part of the a spiritual body. And very interestingly, you know, when when we read about um, Paul and his uh, his conversation with the Lord on the road to Damascus, what did the Lord say? Right? Um, he uh, asks him. Paul asks a question. Um, you know, the Lord actually asks the question. Paul, Paul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? What was what was Saul doing? Who was he persecuting? <clears throat> he, he, he was, yeah, he was persecuting the believers. He was arresting the believers. He was arresting all those who who said, you know, they are followers of Jesus. He was arresting them. He was putting them in prison and all that, even bringing them, you know, a death sentence, all that. Now the Lord Jesus says. Saul, he asked the question, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So again, we understand that, okay, this is something that the Lord takes personally because for him, every believer is part of his body. So that's why the Lord says, you know, why are you persecuting me? Okay, so we see that we are spiritually, we are the body of Christ, you know, which is a great privilege, you know, which is a great privilege, which is a, I think in terms of identity, this is something amazing. That I, um, you know, someone who was far away from him, someone who rebelled against him, someone who was caught in all sin, 
you know, the Lord has purchased, washed, justified me and placed me through the Holy Spirit in as part of a spiritual body. Okay. As part of something that's growing together and, and so on. Right. So that is something that we see. The second one that we see is that the church doesn't have an end, doesn't have an expiry date. Right. So sometimes we see, you know, this church, they, they used to meet there, then they stopped. Okay. Wait, what happened? You know, somebody, maybe the pastor, you know, left the country. You've heard about that, right? I've heard. Like, the church doesn't meet here anymore. Why? The pastor went to the US, so they stopped meeting here. Okay. Now, actually, maybe the gathering stopped, but the church is eternal, meaning it, it goes on and on. For example, you know, Ephesians 2 and verse 7 says, um, you know, I'm in chapter 1. I think in the PDF, this is page number, yeah, page number 8. Okay. So Ephesians 1, Ephesians, sorry, Ephesians 2 and verse 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He's talking about the body. Right? He's talking about the body of Christ. And he's saying that in the ages to come, Ephesians 1, he's talking about, you know, Christ is the head, the church is the body, and so on. Ephesians 2, he's talk, continuing to talk about the church and saying, in the ages to come, right? Not only on in this age, but in the ages to come, what does he want to show? He wants to show the exceeding riches of the grace of God in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So, this idea of the church is not just for earth alone, it continues, that we are continuing to be the body of Christ. God wants, still wants to do some things in us and through us. Right? So we see that it's not a temporary thing, doesn't have an expiry date. The church, the spiritual body of Christ continues on. Okay? So it's eternal, something that doesn't end. Okay. Third thing that we see is that the church is Christ's instrument or weapon, or a tool for what? To execute, to put to practice, right? To start and finish his purposes. Okay. In the natural, if you look at your, you know, your your own physical body, you know, how do you, like, how do you process commands? You know, how do you, look, you know, how do you reach out for your water bottle and drink, or how do you reach out for that cup of coffee and drink? Right. How do you do that? Because there is a command that is sent from the brain, from the head. You know, there's a processing. There is a signal. There is a command that is sent. That right. you see and you say, okay, I feel thirsty and maybe I need to drink. Now, in a split second, there is a signal that is sent from the brain, right? to our hand or, you know, to, and, and so that the muscles work and then you reach out and you pick up and, you know, you, you do what needs to be done. So it happens in a split second, right? So since we are the spiritual body of Christ and he is the head, the body does what, what the head commands. Okay. So the, he's the head. He's giving, issuing instructions. He's giving commands. And we are the body, and we, we, which means that uh, as the body of Christ, as individual members, as collectively as members, we need to make every attempt to hear and to listen. Is there a difference between hearing and listening? What is the difference? Right. So, yeah, so hearing is, you know, I, I can hear something, I can hear some noise, I can hear some sound that's coming. But listening is, you know, we are, sorry? Yeah, you're paying attention to understand. Okay, what is it? Okay, I can hear some sound, but what is it? And you, maybe you are even asking questions. Sorry, I didn't understand that. I didn't catch that. What did you say? So you're actually listening. You know, you're giving importance to what is being said in order to take it with the intent of, you're doing something with it, right? So as the body of Christ, we need to really take, uh, or, you know, take the effort to hear, to listen, and also to carry out. Because he's the head. He issues the command. Now, 
we need to you know we need to do that okay which means we need we we should not do what is opposite of that opposite of that is okay i don't care i'm here i don't care or you know it could be like i really don't know i don't know what god wants i don't really care uh, you know i'm just living my life i'm going to you know pursue whatever uh, whatever you know whatever comes my way i do no because we cannot be passive we cannot be you know dormant or <clears throat> in, in, in any of those you know things right so we need to really actively pursue god and actively listen god what are you saying because hey he has a big plan for the church you know it could be three people four people gathering together it could be you know 10000s of people gathering together but he wants to release something you know he wants to extend his kingdom he wants to you know not just extend the kingdom but bring kingdom purposes into earth heaven's plans onto earth he wants to bring in right in the lifetime that we live right through us and we might think okay who am i you know what am i to do this but the lord doesn't ask any of those questions he's saying okay this is you are part of my body and therefore you qualify you received me as lord and savior therefore you qualify i washed you with my precious blood and justified you therefore you qualify to walk and carry out my kingdom purposes right okay so we are here to hear uh because he's given us the authorization and we understand it and we need to carry it out right the fourth thing that we see is that the church is the when we talk about church again we are talking about the body of believers right the church is the complete representation of christ what do we mean by the term representation anyone when you say you know i i represent so and so or i'm representing huh yeah so when we say that what do we mean by that <clears throat> yeah mm -hmm. yeah so when you say represent what does that mean um on behalf of you're actually conveying what the nation would convey right you stand for all that the nation stands for right all that is maybe you know important to that country important to that body uh, important to that organization right you are actually standing as someone who who who's actually saying that yes um i understand all that and uh, all that my nation wants to convey i am conveying right so you are there as a spokesperson right you are there to convey communicate all that the nation wants to communicate right and <clears throat> whatever oh, uh, okay yeah somebody used the biju says ambassador right you are representing and you are you are there as a you know person who's communicating you are you are there as a spokesperson so it's it's wonderful right so the thing is that the church the body of believers we together represent jesus right and not just partly but a complete representation let's look at you know uh, some of the scriptures which talk about that ephesians 1 again ephesians 1 verse 23 um says the fullness of him you know he talking about talking about the christ so it's talking about the church let's look at uh, the verse before that if it, yeah efficiency 1 okay um okay um <clears throat> so this is actually paul's prayer right to the vision church so he's saying uh maybe we can read from verse 20 onwards right which he worked in Christ when he raised him up from the dead and seated him in the right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church which is his body 
the fullness of him who fills all in all okay let's read that again he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head okay he put all things he's talking about powers dominions principalities power right all things under whose feet jesus feet and jesus is given as head over all things to the church okay he is the head over all these things to the church verse 23 which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all okay so which is his body the fullness so which means church is the fullness of christ the full representation of christ now if you look at the message uh, bible the message version it says the church you see is not peripheral to the world the world is peripheral to the church the church is christ's body in which he speaks and acts by which he fills everything with his presence okay the amplified version says um, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all for in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete who fills everything everywhere with himself okay so we see that well this church is something you know something far greater far superior to anything that we had imagined right the body of believers we represent christ in fullness it says the fullness dwells so when we say fullness you know completeness right every believer every body is filled with the fullness filled with this fullness okay which means that uh, when you talk about fullness of christ what are we talking about you know the fullness of his attributes the character the fullness of his power the fullness of everything his love his compassion his forgiveness the fullness of you know the anointing with which he walked in everything is given to the church right so that is that goes beyond um, you know sometimes it, it's like you know is it is it real you know, is it true well this is the spiritual you know this is the this is how this was this is a spiritual reality right so the responsibility is on us when we know that this is the spiritual reality for us to really receive that revelation right because authorization is there permission is there for us to receive that revelation and for us to rise up to its place for the church to rise up for the church to you know stop all this striving and pity you know all the squabblings and everything to rise up to that fullness which is already granted i think this is how i see it so for us to walk in the fullness of it for us to come to that place of understanding for us to come to that place of unity and say hey, this is what church is this is who we are collectively this is how jesus looks at us so let's wake up you know and and do what he what he wants us to do so it's a powerful realization uh, sorry realization right for the body of believers it's a powerful realization saying hey this is how jesus looks at me and this is how not just looking at me because it is it is the reality that is why he you know he sees me because that is the reality right so every member of the body is filled with the fullness of Christ. Okay. So the number now, now the member may not realize it. Okay. The member may not understand. The member may not realize. Now, I may not realize. I'm saying, am I filled with the fullness of Christ? What does that even mean? Right? I'm filled with the fullness of Christ. I'm part of the body. And whatever Christ is, and who what in whatever manner he walked on the earth. I am filled in that same fullness. Right? So collectively as a church, we are called to represent, again, you know, that term represent Christ collectively as a church. So how would how would how was church how how did Jesus minister on the earth? With the Holy Spirit power, right? How did he face problems? How did he face the storms? How did he face anything right, with the peace of God just in him? Sorry? With authority, right? 
uh, he walked in authority, he walked in the fullness of the Holy Spirit anointing and power and whatever he did, he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. He walked in kingdom authority, he walked in purity, he walked in holiness, right? He walked uh, with the agape love of God just flowing out of him, right? And the church is a representation, full representation, right? Not just 5%, 10%, but the full 100% representation. You know? So because we are filled with his fullness. So let's read that verse again, you know, Ephesians 1, 23, 22 and 23. Okay, so 22 says, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Now, the reality is something else, right? This is the spiritual reality. But in actual actual thing, we see that, okay, some people are, some people have not, you know, woken up to this yet, right? Some people have not got the re re realization. Maybe people are caught up in their own problems. Now, they are got a low estimation of who they are. They don't even have maybe an understanding of what church is. Maybe for them, church is something like a, Social gathering. Hey, I come, I go. Uh, it maybe is for them. For some, it's an understanding. The, the, you know, for them the understanding is it's a place. I'm a believer, or I'm a I'm a Christian. So Sunday morning I go to church. You know, other other days that I don't think about. I don't you know because I got too many other things. So I don't need to think about it. I don't need to. But the Lord Jesus is thinking. Lord Jesus is saying, hey, you represent me. You, know, you are part of my body. And you are filled with the fullness that comes from me. Right? So, so Paul was actually trying to, in every church that he planted, in every city that he visited, in every church, you know, the church in Corinth and Ephesus, Ephesus are you know, great examples where he's saying, hey, guys, this is who you are. This is your identity. Your identity is not with the world. Your identity is not, you know, to uh, the struggle with the, with, the, with the sinful things. Your identity is not with your struggle with the flesh and all that. Your identity is something else. You know, God looks at you, uh, you know, differently. So you need to begin. You need to begin to look at you, at yourself, not just individually, but you know, as a church. You need to start looking at yourselves differently. Okay. Yeah. Then the other thing that we see is that um, the church is the complete representation, right? Um, every believer is a member of Christ's body. Okay, that we saw already with every believer. Okay, um, young, old, right, mature, immature, okay, whatever season of life they are in, right? Every believer, the struggling believer, the victorious believer, the playful believer, right? The you know. Every believer is part of the body of Christ. Right? So maturity happens when a believer actually understands that and conducts his or her life with that revela revelation, with that realization. So maturity you know, takes place. We begin to move towards Christ-likeness because this is how Christ is like. So when we need to move towards Christ-likeness, we also need to be like him. This is how he sees. This is what he wants from the church. So we begin to move towards Christ-likeness. Okay, a few other things that we see is that part of the church is in heaven and part of it is on earth. Okay, which means that, um, you know, in Ephesians, again, it says, uh, Ephesians 3 and verse 14, For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, okay, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. You know, do we see that, right? From whom the home family in heaven and on earth is named. So which means that uh, believers who have gone to be with the Lord, believers who remain here on earth, everyone, you know, we are part of the body of Christ. Okay, so uh, we are part of the eternal body of Christ. Okay, so any any thoughts? Any um, any questions on this? Yeah. Yes, in the Old Testament, 
um sorry okay the logic of the so yeah so the so the whole understanding of the temple is people gathered there of course but the temple being a uh, a place where people encountered god right so you came there the priest was there to represent uh, even at the tabernacle the priest was there to represent god to the people and people to the you know to god he took the you know he interceded etc offerings were made and everything so this was a way god instituted where people could actually come and experience him interact with him and you know sins could be covered and all those things happen right so um so the church i mean the the temple also carried the the idea that this is a dwelling place the ark of the covenant was there the presence of god was experienced and all that but when we move we see that we are the temple of god right so with the new dispensation it, it you know it is a complete change right he chooses to tabernacle with man right uh, and we are the temple of god we are the dwelling place so so the whole thing changes now so yeah so that's the difference and yeah, that's a shift okay any any questions or any thoughts um so um so the thing is we need to begin to start looking at church differently you know that's that's a way to practically you know uh, put it in practice right um i know sometimes people write off some churches as dead churches you know this is a dead church um nothing is happening there people are always fighting committee members are fighting with the members members are fighting with the committees and you know but god can actually revive okay so there's something to pray for i'm saying god you know you bring revival Uh, in this church you know so we we can say okay we can we can look at you know different church. like yesterday i was just having a conversation with the um, with a gentleman he was from a from a catholic church right he became a believer and uh, you know uh, during covid time he was watching some of these programs on prayer and something and he he became a believer and he continued to go to the catholic church right and then he realized hey i need more i need more of god and i feel very restricted etc and he he started to explore you know other places and and so on um but so you know this is what he was saying he's saying you know i asked him you know are there more people like you you know who maybe at, attend or part of the catholic church for a season but who are who have experienced the power of god who have you know experienced salvation he says yeah there are many families many families some well they have not yet come out but they are there very much there and they worship jesus well they are not part of the ritualistic things and all that but you know they are there so which means that god is actually make you know he's moving wherever people are gathering in his name right yes there could be certain things that are wrong there could be certain things that are completely you know unscriptural but god is moving he is changing lives you know wherever so we should not write off you know there can be revival and i think the charismatic catholic renewal happened as a result of people praying and saying god you know pour out your spirit we need eyes to be opened and you know ears to be open and people need to experience you so um and and so so also you know the church of the kind of church that i come from you know uh, people were praying people who actually salvation they were praying and there was a and uh, you know i've there was this person who used to go there every saturday and he used to kneel and pray over every seat right kneel and pray over every seat you know what we call as traditionally called pews right these long benches pray kneel and pray you know for every seat and saying god you know bless the person touch the person who's going to sit here tomorrow and i think i was an answered prayer to that you know that that gentleman's prayer he prayed lord touch this person touch this guy <laughs> you know and i i would have i definitely sat there and god touched me so um yeah so kofi you have a question go ahead please 
So thank you very much. Um, uh, sorry, one, just one. Let me just. Yeah, go ahead. I need a little clarification on this. And there's this argument yeah. in respect to the rock. When you read Matthew chapter sixteen, verse fifteen. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is an argument that Jesus is also referred to as the rock of ages. He is also the rock. And when yeah. and when he spoke to Peter, which also means the rock, Jesus referred to us, you are Peter, which means the rock. And on this rock, you, Peter, am I going to build the church? And then mm. the other argument has to do with you are Peter on the rock that you, Peter, are referring to. That is Jesus Christ. Am I yeah. going to build my church? So yeah. I need a little clarification there. Yeah. So yeah. So that's the. Let's just read that uh, Matthew sixteen verse uh, seventeen, right? So, eighteen. Uh, sorry. Yes. Nine. Please. Yeah. Eighteen onwards. So yeah. So very clearly, uh, you know, he's referring to uh, uh, Peter as, of course, you know, several several things that we see that. Uh, one is uh, Peter's name. He he actually has this conversation. Peter, you will be called, you know, Simon. You will be called, uh, you know, Peter, and so on. And on this rock, okay, the the thing, the word rock, and like you rightly said, you know, different people pulling in different directions about these rocks. Okay, so, um, so the thing is that um, when it refers to, um. On this rock I will build, and and we see, you know, not just that isolated verse, but we see the rest of Scripture. We see that Jesus is the cornerstone; that He is the foundation. He's the starting point, or the most important structure in the church, right? And uh, if you consider, like Peter himself, Peter himself did not, you know, just go around saying. Hey guys, I am the rock on which the church is built, right? That was never he. In fact, he said, if you if you look at, um, uh, I think, um, let's say, First uh, Peter chapter five, right, uh, and verse two: Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but um, eagerly. And not nor as being lords over those interested to you, but being examples to the flock. But when the chief shepherd appears, that you will receive the crown of glory uh, that does not fade away. Okay, so so he's saying, you know, hey, this is the flock of God, right? And he's saying, you know, that you do what you need to do with all humility, uh, and uh, you know, we need to give an account for the to the chief shepherd. Uh, you serve as overseer, so. You know, he he did not see himself as a rock. Okay, so um, and and the Lord, uh, you know, and, and Peter also says in I think First Peter two, verse four, where he says, you know, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but um, you know, chosen by God and precious, and you also are, as living stones are being built up a spiritual house and so on. So. Um, you know, so so we see that understanding. So, well, we could say that he was one of the living stones on which Christ is building, but never the 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 stone or you know the rock. Uh, so so yeah, so we see that it could refer to the rock of that. Con Jesus being the cornerstone. Um, Jesus being the because the earlier question is. Who do you say that I am, or who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Jesus, you are Jesus, the Son of the Living God. So, and so the Lord obviously is referring to the cornerstone Himself, being the foundation, being the most important structure on which the church is being built. You know, some people have also said on this revelation, right, which is which would also be not wrong. Um, look at if you look at it. So, yeah, so that would be my response. Definitely, it's not. Peter the man, but it's Jesus the Lord. Yeah, so I hope that helps, Andrew. Um, oh, Thank you very sorry. much. Kofi, yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, so Abhishek, uh, you have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Abhishek. Yeah, uh, good morning, Pastor. Just want to mm -hmm. add on in this. So, yeah. uh, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter had finished his sermon and lots of people, they repent. Yeah. And they, uh, and they have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yeah. So, can't we say as like... Uh, when uh, Jesus has said this, I am going to build the church on you. So this is the first church we can say. Like uh, This is the starting of the new church, the New mm. Testament church. Mm. So can't we say like this? So um, because of his message, because Peter shared the message immediately, the first sermon? Yes, yes, yes Pastor. Um, I don't know. That would be kind of, you know, stretching it a bit. Um, yeah, so I don't think we can kind of equate that because, um, of course, he shared he shared the gospel. He made that connection between outpouring of the spirit and you know the Joel two twenty eight prophecy and all that. But um, to say that okay, this we can't uh, equate that. See, because the the problem with that would be you know um, that. Peter and whatever he said or his ministry is is the structure that is holding the church. You know that would that would be the understanding, right? If we would equate that, that would be the understanding. But but Peter was like all of us, like any of us. Of course, he was the apostle of the Lamb, and uh, he was the founding. You know, um, uh, the Lord used him to write uh, some of the doctrines and scripture and and so on. So all that is yes relevant. But the structure of the church does not rest on Peter, you know. So when we when we equate, equate this, then we would we would have to say the whole structure rests on Peter, uh, which is not which is not correct. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Pastor. Right. Okay. Okay. So, any other questions? Um, yeah. Uh, like you mentioned uh, in our area also. Let's switch on. Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, okay. Fine. Like in our church also, believers, uh, we have uh, divided into two parts. So believer used to fight with each other. So some of the believers, they wanted to leave the church. Okay. The Lutheran church. But in our ch city, there's only two church. One is Lutheran, one is Catholic. Okay. So if they want to uh, leave Lutheran, they have to go Catholic, like this the situation is. Okay. But they don't want to go in Luther it's a Catholic also. Mm. So in this situation, what they are supposed to do? Mm. So they want to leave the the Lutheran church. They are believers, but they don't want to continue worshipping there. And what is the reason? Uh, mm. Okay, so there are factions, they are fighting with each other, and so people you know, they, they they discourage, they want to leave. Okay. But there are no other churches like an AG or any other spiritual church. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I see. Okay. So there are okay, so what um what um Caleb, right? Sorry. Caleb, or what is your name? Sorry, Nelson. I forget. Uh, Nelson, Nelson. What Nelson is saying is that um, yeah, there are you know in his hometown there are churches. Uh, there are only two churches. One is uh, Catholic and the Lutheran. Uh, these are the traditional uh, organized churches. But then there are certain other offshoots or certain gatherings, but they are not registered. So, uh, which means you know when when it happens to uh, when it comes to like burying believers or you know conducting weddings uh, and all that. They don't have the official authorization as per the law of the land, right? So, so it's a difficult situation. Okay. So one thing is, um, yes, the believers should start praying for the church. Okay. Uh, they are part of the church. It's it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult thing to sit Sunday after Sunday when you know that okay, you know, the guy who's sitting in front of you is has fought and has you know said all kinds of things about you or you know. 
so it's a difficult thing so the thing is to start praying for the church right? start praying for unity start praying for the pastor start praying for the committee uh, start praying for all those who are not believers yet because traditional church everybody comes because they are born into the family so start praying for that right so and the lord will start touching you know in answer to our prayer of faith and, and the lord also gives strategies right maybe to the young maybe to the married maybe to the elderly you know strategies to how to reach out maybe it, initially it can be just one on one but then um yeah it it will happen right and and we will see the change happening from the inside out it may not be you know it may not happen in a day it could but we will see change happening right especially maybe the youth you know they are sincere they are they want you know they want to know more and uh, maybe the pastor can give permission for the youth to gather in the church pray worship whatever and and uh, one of the mature believers or you know one of the youth who has experienced jesus and instead of wanting to go out they can actually do something inside and that would help right so daniel has a question who can start a new church well any believer you've been authorized you've been given the kingdom keys of the kingdom you've been given the authorization to go start right and that is what we see in the book of acts okay but also ask the lord lord what do you want me to do uh because it's not just about starting but also continuing right continuing to nurture continuing to steward god's call so yeah it's it's good to ask the lord lord what do you want me to do um yeah what is a what is your call what is your plan purpose yeah and then go for it but also we see uh, some up you know some are called to maybe just plant just to sow and we see in the book of acts that um, just like philip you know philip moved from jerusalem to samaria he started the church he shared the gospel people there believed he was there for some time there was a great revival but then god asked him to move on right so he went to gaza then he went to uh, azotus the lord took him to azotus then he went to caesarea and he continued there we don't see whether he was a you know maybe there was a church gathering we don't know but he started what the work in samaria he started peter and john came there and prayed for the you know the baptism of the holy spirit and so on so we see that so anybody actually can start a church uh, what is a church church is the gathering of believers you know gathering in the name of jesus so you know you can start um uh, you know a gathering get people saved and uh, and you know regularly gather and you can give leadership and so on so um uh, but they but understand that you know if if that is the call of god then you can just go at it full on right because the kind of challenges that nelson was talking about you know that is bound to happen as the church grows right so when it comes to the official registration and etc so all that we will look at it and uh, so all that will come into play so so we need to be ready for that right so yeah so bless his uh, question is it right, right to start a church without god's calling okay the fact is that god has called each one of us what is what, what has god called all the disciples to do okay it's good to ask that question what has god called me you know generally as a disciple what is he called this is irrespective of young old you know brand new mature you are called to you are commissioned called and commissioned to go preach the gospel right uh, we are called and commissioned to teach all that the lord jesus has observed or, or taught us to observe we are called to baptize believers in the name of the father son and holy spirit this is something that he has called us to do so that is something that we can do right so in that we see in the book of acts that people started churches okay and again church gathering of believers they preach the gospel and say okay now see you go preach the gospel there are believers either now the situation is you can either connect them to a church which is already there okay there are already good churches there you can either connect them to church or if the call of god is that you be there and you shepherd that you know the body of believers you do that so right your question is uh, you know start maybe maybe the start is not the question maybe the, st- the question is you know how do i has god called me to plant and shepherd 
a church right so if that is a question yes we need to ask him lord where when uh, how you know all those questions are there yeah we need to ask okay so uh, andrew's question what is the relation of the kingdom of god and the church okay so when we say kingdom uh, again there is a, another course which you're going to be I don't know if you've already gone through Kingdom of God. No, uh, so you you know we're going to look into it. Uh, the different aspects of God's kingdom, you know, Kingdom of Heaven, Kingdom of God, um, you know, used interchangeably. So, Kingdom of God, King Kingdom is the realm of the King, the rule and reign of the King. The you know when you say Kingdom, it's the territory of the King. Like um, so kings part of one kingdom which means that okay this is the borders of the kingdom and and so on so so the kingdom of god is the rule and reign of the king okay and when we when we say the local church in the local church we need the rule and reign of the king okay so we pray lord let your kingdom come let your will be done right so we, which means that we need the rule and reign of the king in the individual believer, Lord, let your kingdom come, let you will be done. And also collectively as believers, we need the rule and reign of the king in the church. So, you know, that would that we would say as maybe one of the dynamics of the kingdom of God and the church, right? Um, one of the, you know, relations, which means that we need the kingdom, we need the rule and reign of the king, if you want to simply put in the church. Okay, very quickly, um, when will we learn the permission we need from government to start a church in india in this course okay um let me see there is the um, practical aspect of it a little bit but there is also another course called church administration and ministry okay um some practical aspect we will see systems processes towards the end of this course um you know and also you know very interesting women in ministry etc bringing correction etc so we will look at it um at the end of the course but in detail about that aspect of church administration, uh, we will see, um, you know, uh, we will learn in that course, uh, church administration and ministry, right? Okay, uh, last question, Abhishek. Uh, if someone has started a church and it's not growing after years also, and that person is praying for years, should the person think that it's not God's calling for his life? Okay, it's a very complex question. Shall we take it in the next class? <laughs> okay, it's a big, big answer, right? So many factors, but the simple thing is this, you know, um, well, and not necessary, you know, fruitfulness, yes, is a, is a part of the call of God, is part of the ministry, right? Uh, fruitfulness. So how do we define fruitfulness? That's the thing, right? Um, maybe certain people are there and, you know, and God has called them to minister and, you know, maybe they just reached out to one person, you know, Philip reached out to one person in uh, Ethiopian official, the Ethiopian official went back to his country and then the whole nation was open to the gospel, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah, you know, fruitfulness, we need to see. We need to see what is stopping it. Is the church being relevant? So that's why I said, you know, it's a, too many factors are there. So it need not always be, hey, I was not called for this. Need not be. It is because that maybe certain things the church is not being relevant maybe certain things need to be tweaked certain things need to be done right so i would say that okay okay thank you uh, good questions uh, we'll stop you right here god bless